Welcome back to Learn SKN, and today we have an agricultural science lecture video for you. Today we are going to continue where we left off in the agricultural science syllabus for CXC, and that would be we last looked at section A, Introduction to Agriculture, and we looked at specific objective number 3.1, discuss the major challenges affecting local and regional agriculture and possible solutions. So we looked at that last time. And so today we are going to jump into section B, crop production. And to start off, we are going to look at specific objective one, anatomy and physiology of the plant. And so this is somewhat of a longer um, section. And so we're going to take it piece by piece. And so today we are going to use mainly the textbook and then we're going to use some PowerPoints if we reach up to wherever um, part of the plant we reach up to. But for the first thing, let's go to the intro for this section. And so the first thing they were asking us here is, of course, explain the uses of plants in agriculture. And that's a very simple, straightforward one. You know, it's not going to take too long. So plants are used for food, feed, fiber, fuel, medicine, industrial uses, and amenities, ornamental and recreational uses. So plants are used for crops, for both people to eat and for animals to consume so we all of us need plants all in the plant the animal kingdom humans and animals alike we need plants and so plants are used for food for both people and animals so some animals the the herbivores they are reared on of course plant-based material and some humans even today some of us are vegans and vegetarians and so we stick to a plant-based diet but so you know, you get the gist, it's for food. Plants are also used for biodiesel or biofuels in general. We have things like corn and sugarcane. They are now being used to make, you know, ethanol and certain other biofuels. Some people say that might be the future. We don't know, but you know, that's a problem because we now have our food source competing with the energy sector. So now large pieces of land can, is now, can be now dedicated to food that is used for biofuel, biodiesel, etc. So that's an issue that we have to work out later on. Crops are grown for medicine or cosmetics, such as aloe vera. Of course, you have the aloe vera plant here. So you know, aloe vera is grown especially for cosmetics. A lot of people swear by aloe vera, makes the skin all nice and smooth, etc., etc. Plants are also used for, you know, recreational purposes, therapeutics, you know, for, for example, some people might, you know, smoke maybe something plant-based for recreational purposes or they can also smoke that for medicinal purposes plants provide employment and an income for persons in that sector farmers and botanists and those kind of persons and so apart from all that plants also provide health and will just benefits to humans so plants you know it's self-explanatory as i said we know what plants are used for and so you know, we we can really easily expound on that without even going too in depth. You know, especially we have plants such as cotton, the jute, um, hemp. All those are used in the the textile industry to make your clothes and stuff like that. So you know, you know all the uses of plants. Plants are used for shelter. You know, your basic needs, food, clothing, shelter. So they are used for shelter in terms of lumber used to make you know buildings and furniture and those kind of things. So plants are vital to the survival of human race in essence so that's basically the major uses of plants that are used in agriculture and so we have to start looking at the structure of the plants and so we're going to look at different parts of the plant piece by piece section by section so that we understand the function of certain parts and how they play a role in helping the plant to survive but before that we have to now classify plants under certain headings so plants can be classified or put into groups based on certain familiarities certain headings for example you have uh, seed plants and flowering plants that's a group by itself plants that produce seed plants that produce flowers those are that's a group by itself those can be divided into monocotyledons and dicotyledons so that's another family that is another group in which you can break down plants into so you can break them into family such as monocotyledons and dicotyledons can be divided up into smaller groups which have many features in common, for example, peas and beans, etc. 
then you can group plants or classify them based on their life cycle or how long it take to germinate produce and then die so the life cycle some plants germinate grow flower seed and die completing their life cycle in one growing season or in one year and those are called annuals so when you have an annual plant that's one that that your plant it germinates it grows it produces it dies all within one season one cropping season so one year then you have your examples are your, your lettuce your peas your corn your tomatoes your bell peppers etc but some plants take two growing seasons all right or two years to complete their life cycle and for those we call them biennials so you have the biennials here that take two growing seasons to complete their life cycle or two years and examples would be carrots celery dashin and other plants all right some flowers do produce seed for many many years and they are what we call perennials so perennials are plants that you know have a life cycle that exceeds the biennial so it exceeds two years or two cycles two seasons these are plants that grow and grow and grow and they're not going to die unless something happen drastically happen to them like a hurricane or lightning or you know termites or something like that so examples would be you know your popular trees you have your citrus your mango your cocoa your coffee etc those larger trees some trees like the pine tree they would take years hundred of years all right some people would pile with um pine trees and you have olive trees for example again olive trees take years and years and years and they produce for years and years and years some people actually can leave olive trees in the inheritance for the grandchildren because of how long your life cycle is so those are examples of what we call perennials but of course they can be divided in other groups you know evergreen and those kind of things but we're not going to go into that we're just sticking to the more surface level for this level of agriculture and of course you can group plants based on their growth habits, such as they can be herbs, they can be shrubs, they can be trees. So herbs are plants with a soft, non-woody stem, usually less than two meters in height. Example, parsley, body beans. And so you have all those examples here. And then you have shrubs, they have, diff they, have, they have stiff woody stems and produce branches close to the ground and grow to heights of less than five meters. For example, West Indian cherry, you have your rose and stuff like that. Those are shrubs. And then you have trees. They are tall, woody plants with a well-defined trunk and branches at some distance from the ground. And of course, you have the examples out there, mangoes, your guinea, your breadfruit, your citrus. Then you have the mahogany, teak, whatever. So those are trees. The larger ones, those are trees. So not all plants are trees. Let's, that, let's get that out of the way. Not all plants are trees, but all trees are plants. But of course, you have other subcategories that they can be divided into. For example, you have grasses, you have runners, you have twiners, and other types of um, plants that can be used to classify or put in groups. So those are the basic groups that plants can be classified in. And of course, you have more. You have at least six different you know, shoot systems. So you have your herb, your shrub, your trees, your twiner, your runner, your grass. You have all those things that can be used to classify various plants and then of course like i was saying before you have the plants that can be divided into you know those that, that produce seed and flowers and as such you have your monocotyledons and your dicotyledons and the textbook has them nicely outlined here for you and they have the comparison between the two so monocotyledons usually referred to as monocots and dicotyledons re referred to as dicots are made up of a root system and shoot system of course all plants made up of root system shoot system they can be distinguished by the structure of their seeds arrangement of their flower parts root systems and the shape of their leaves and so we have the diagrammatic table here comparing the two on those different levels and so we look at the seed the monocot of course has as the word say mono one so there's just one cotyledon in the seed just one cotyledon in the monocot seed and an embryo but the dicot seed has of course di2 has two cotyledons and an embryo so you have the embryo with the radical and the pimule we're going to look at that later on when we're looking at seeds by itself but for now just just fyi then when you're comparing them based on root 
they have different root systems. The monocots versus the dicots have different root systems. The most monocots would have a fibrous root system, and most dicots would have a tap rooted system. And so, when you're looking at roots, we are going to look at what is a tap root and what is a fibrous root. And we're going to look at that later on. So, tap root, fibrous root, adventitious root, aerial roots. We're going to look at that later on. So, that's one other way in which you can compare the monocots and the dicots based on their root systems. And of course, you can compare them based on the stem, stemmed with scattered vascular bundles, stemmed with cylindrical arrangement of vascular bundles. Again, we're going to come cover that later on when looking at this, the, the cross section of the stem of various plants. So keep that in mind. It's just an introductory level. So we're going to look at those later on when you're looking at the stem separately. Usually, no cambium present in the stem or root. Can be usually present in the stem and root. So again, we're we'll gonna look at that lately. Later. Long thin leaves with parallel veins. That's the monocot. So you have long thin leaves with parallel veins. Long thin leaves right here with parallel veins. Whereas the dicot would have rounded border leaves with net like arrangements. So this is one right here with you know the veins just going all over. Whereas the monocot the, the veins are going in a parallel direction. And then you have based on the flower, the flower parts in trees. So the monocot, their flowers, they part in trees. So one, two, three. Example, tree petals, tree stamens, tree, I mean stamen, grass flowers, like brightly colored petals or sepals. So another thing is that the flowers for the monocot, they are not as bright as the flowers for the dicot. All right. So the dicot flower, they have their parts more numerous often in fours and fives example five petals five stamen of this petal and stamen often brightly colored so the petals are often brightly colored to attract the bees and stuff like that and we're gonna look at that later on when you're looking at the flower and then we have the examples mainly herbs and grasses with few trees example corn rice sugar cane bamboo orchid ginger those are monocots a lot of the grass family so most grass type plants tend to be monocots Whereas you have herbs, shrubs, and trees, example, cabbage, cotton, citrus, those larger ones tend to be tap rooted, tend to be die cuts. All right, so you see the examples right here. We have the, the, the tomato, and the tomato, of course, is a die cut. And then you have the whole grass. The grass are normally monocots. And so you can look at this table and make clear distinctions between the monocotyledons and the dicotyledons all right so that's a next way in which they occur they are broken down in categories they're classified but you can see the difference on various parts of the flower of the plant sorry and of course the structure of the plant so most plants are divided into two systems two basic systems so you have the root system and you have the shoot system so the root system the shoot system and so the root system as i would tell my students would be most of the parts that are below ground all right the parts that are below ground generally are part of the root system unless you're looking at specialized stems later on and then you have the shoot system which are those mainly above ground such as the flower the leaves the branches the stem the fruit the buds the auxiliary the terminal buds all those things are part of the shoot system and so the again the, the plant is normally divided into two systems that's the shoot system and the root system and those things located above ground tend to be the part of the shoot system and those below ground are part of the root system and so this is how you basically basic introduction to the anatomy of plants as it relates to crop science in agricultural science all right, so we are going to stay here for this video. We're just looking at the basic introduction to the anatomy and the physiology of the plant, which is one of the basic unit of one of the basic parts of agricultural science. So you have your crop production and you have your animal production. And so we are going to do, we're just given an introductory course. And then next time we're going to start looking into various parts of the plant. So we just gave you a overview of the classification of plants on the various headings. And then we looked at the difference between the monocotyledons and the dicotyledons. And then we looked at the plant on a whole 
and looking at the different systems the root system provides anchorage okay and the shoot system and so we're going to look at these separately in subsequent videos all right so that's it for now thanks for watching thanks for listening you know what to do you like you subscribe and hit the notification bell so you know when another video drops for the continuation of the agricultural science syllabus all right so that's it for now